Hey, everybody, and welcome back to How the Fuck Did You Get That Job, where I, your host, dive into the awe-inspiring careers of people who have amazing jobs. Today, the spotlight is on Sophie Kelly, <laughs> beginning with a Bachelor of Arts in Communication from the University of Technology, Sydney, and later an MBA in Corporate Communications. Sophie's journey took off at Low Lintus as a media planner and buyer. Her, traje- her trajectory led her through esteemed roles at Leo Burnett as a group media director, a noteworthy tenure at JWT, New York, and leadership stints at Mojo, Strawberry Frog, the Barbarian, Barbarian Group, and now she steers the ship as the SVP of Global Tequila at Diageo. So, Sophie, <laughs> how the fuck did you get that job? Uh, just lucky, I guess. No, I um, listen, it's been a really fun ride uh, from leaving Australia where I worked uh, with UDVI, uh, which later went on to be bought by Diageo, on uh, ready to drinks and the spirits business from an advertising perspective. I ended up working with Diageo, believe it or not, my entire career. They're who brought me to New York back in 2003. And um, then, you know, after kind of doing uh, agencies and staying in the creative area for many, many years, I um, exited the Barbarian Group and one of my old clients rang me up and he said, well, what are you going to do with your life? And I said, I really don't know. And um, he said, uh, well, why don't you come and run our whiskey business here? And I said, you know, I don't, I've been a CEO. I don't really yeah. want to go client side. I don't like having lots of people who have points of views that I have to deal with. I don't think it's going to work. And he said, well, you know what? It's pretty fun and you might learn something. And after I took off and had a sabbatical, I came back and I said, yeah, this is a pretty good job. That, that I'm going to go job. and work in whiskeys, which yeah. I did for seven years before they said, well, you did such a good job of growing our whiskey business. How about you work on global tequila and mascal? And I went, I, I, I don't know how you would say no, right? Yeah. It's definitely not going to be boring. I, I, I don't think so. I mean, that's a great you know, little synopsis. I want to take us back all the way to growing up, up in Australia. Did you always <laughs> have the wanderlust to come to the States? You know what I did? I always, uh, so funny story is I wanted to be an actress uh, when I was growing up. And in fact- Who were the models that you were going after? Oh, like, you know, Audrey Hepburn, um, some uh, Broadway, like West Side Story. I mean, you name it. I was at a dance company where I did the Rock Lobster. I don't think it was my finest point. And uh, when I was- um, Working out what I wanted to do, I went and auditioned for NIDA. I got quite far down. And I said, if I get in, I'll go. If I don't, I'll go and find a job, right? Sure. So I wanted to work in, in, I wanted to be an actress and I wanted to live in New York from a pretty weirdly young age. Like what? Like, I'm going to say like 14, 15. Oh, wow. So the movies really got to you. Uh-huh. And yeah. then I did speech and drama through school and I um, went into advertising. I didn't go to university straight after school. I didn't want to go back to school. I didn't really like So what you school. do in between? I got jobs. So I nice. started at the Intercontinental. I was on the front desk and I went to the hotel school there and... It was there that I first went to the advertising agency, Low Lintos. They said, oh, we're going over. You're interested in marketing. Why don't you come check it out? I just thought it was the coolest place I'd ever walked into, right? Big posters, cool people, uh, art everywhere. And I just really liked the vibe. And it was at that point that I thought, you know what? This is creative, but it's also business. It feels like I'm working in a publishing magazine house. So... Everyone I would meet, I would say, how do I get a job in those ad agencies? And uh, as it turns out, I met a few people who worked in media. So I started as a media buyer. And back in that day, I was ticking off the television spots from the faxes that from the layouts that we'd done to the faxes that came from the television stations for the Australian Port Corp was one of my clients and Kellogg. That, that's so fun. When you're telling your friends that you're in advertising, uh, what are their reactions? <laughs> At that time yeah. or now? No, 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 that time. Oh, look, it was super cool. It was a super cool business and I was in media. Um, so 
you know, we got in that day, I was flatting with a friend of mine. Um, she wasn't, I, I never knew she was going to end up being the friend that she was. She actually started the same time as a junior and she kept trying to copy me and what I was doing and really gave me the shit. So I was like, why don't you do your own studying? But um, at that time, the network reps would take us out for dinner and lunch. And that's how we got ourselves through these jobs because they didn't pay that well. Yeah. So we had to get free food all the time. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit of a ride. It was a good time. That is. So you end up moving to the States. What's the job that brings you over? Diageo, but working with JWT. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if anyone remembers that uh, product Smirnoff Ice, mm -hmm. but it was of course. around the launch of that. Everybody so. knows what it feels like to get iced. <laughs> <laughs> I um, worked on Smirnoff Ice and yeah. uh, worked on that globally and worked on Smirnoff globally with JWT and I came over uh, with that with that position. So that was pretty fun, pretty amazing. I remember walking into New York and walking into the office and feeling like I'd gone back in time because it was so conservative and everyone had offices. But hey, And what was expectation versus reality when coming stateside to work on ice? I think it was, the difference was in Australia, you kind of have to handle loads of things because you don't have the scale of the business. So coming to the US, and just focusing on one thing was a really weird thing for me. So I became very, very impatient. I wanted to get more and more projects, keep busy doing multiple things. Uh, and I think one of the biggest things was getting used to the focus, the sort of silos and the scale of the business at that time and not having multiple things to jump around uh, on. I like to be busy. I like to do things I don't know how to do. I'm super curious and I'm always poking my nose in, trying to work out how to do things that I don't understand. So, T Tell me a story about, you talk about curiosity and pushing the, the limits as well. When's the time where your curiosity really, you know, sh <laughs> shined, shined so, and then also may have, you know, went in the, the unintended consequence? Yeah, yeah. Look, I think I believe that our careers and work is about life experiences, right? And if you view it that way, you're kind of writing the best book on yourself that you're ever gonna write new chapters, doing different things and gathering really cool expertise, hopefully, as you go along. I think when I uh, first left JWT and, and wanted to work in a smaller environment, owner-operated um, business, that was a big, uh, journey for me. I was an MD, I had to set vision, all that kind of stuff. But the job that I think I had no right to do was when Benjamin Palmer and, and um, Keith uh, approached me about the Barbarian Group. And it was a hot, hot, hot digital production group with like amazing engineers like Andrew Bell and many, many more, Keith Butters. And they said, um, you know, you're not, you, why don't you come work with us. And I said, I have no idea about digital or digital product creation. None. Why would you want me to come? And they went, well, you know this stuff, which is brand planning, strategy, big client business, and we know this stuff. So let's get together and make an awesome business. And at that time, I think Barbarian Group was about 25 people. It had like 350 projects on its book. They were heavily software engineering projects. And we turned it into a beautiful uh, digital agency that led through digital product and digital thinking and built media with Colin Nagy and awesome people uh, around us and had just rip roaring five years. It was amazing. So, Very cool. you know, if I wasn't curious and I didn't want to learn and I didn't want to be in an yeah. environment I had no business being in, I wouldn't have got all that experience. We went on to win a grant, the, the, uh, inaugural Grand Prix for innovation that was given to us um, uh, uh, back in the day when they first created the the innovation uh, section for Grand, uh, for Can Line. So with that a piece awesome. of software, and I remember saying to these guys, you know, we're going to enter the Grand Prix of innovation. They went, what are we going to enter it with? I said, we're going to enter it with our product Cinder, which was a production uh, uh, software piece that that allowed multiple screens to talk to each other with better um, uh, quality. 
And if any of these guys ever listen to this web uh, webcast, they're probably going to say, wow, she really butchered that. But, <laughs> um, you know, it was amazing. So curiosity, you know, to do something that I didn't think I could do, curiosity to be vulnerable enough to yeah. learn. And then um, the best time I had, one of the best times I had in my career. And I think, you know, uh, doing that uh, is why I jumped into the whiskey job and why I'm doing yeah. what I'm doing now, you know, versus taking another yeah. CEO role yeah. or COO role in an agency, which I could have done post Barbarian. Yeah. Um, and and so I want to jump into the whiskey and tequila game, but you've held a plethora of positions, right? For our listeners, what would you say has separated the good ones from the not so good ones when it comes to either leadership or like, oh, and, man. or, 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 super, or anything? This is super simple for me and I can only articulate it now because I've failed on it a couple of times yeah. <laughs> badly. Uh, so sharing, understanding what your role is, in the business and in the company and what you want to achieve and making sure that that is aligned with the people you're working with is really important. And that what they want you to do is what you want to do and that you will get energy from doing it is really important because we don't do anything well if we don't love it and we don't yeah. have energy. Sure, and how do you figure that out too in the interview process, right? It's really hard Yeah, and I do it a lot better now that I'm in my 50s than I did yeah. <laughs> when I was in my 20s, yeah. right? So uh, get a coach, network, have mentors around you and discuss the opportunities because someone else is going to look at it differently to you and they're going to help you prep for those discussions. The second thing is values. You know, we work in a world where if you really evaluate it, when it goes wrong, it's because you don't share the same values. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... For me, why am I at Diageo? 2030, society uh, of progress, uh, spirit of progress values that we have are really important to me around responsible drinking, around diversity and inclusion, around uh, sustainability, our ESG agenda. You know, we are a business that enjoys doing business the right way and we prioritize that. So for me, Unless I I get into those questions straight away if anyone approaches me and I sure. work out that I don't want to work for a business that doesn't value the fact that we need to have a positive impact on the world. So it's like, what is the job and what do you think you can do there? And when you discuss your vision for it, do people feel energized by it or are they putting you in a box? Mm. And then do you share the same values? What would you say your core values are? Mine, transparency. Uh, I'm very tenacious, I'm very ambitious. Uh, I like to be disruptive. I like to do stuff that's distinctive. And I really get energy from transforming stuff and doing new things, right? I, re I really feel that when marketing is on fire, you are opening up new areas of growth that other people can't see because of our vantage point which is to look at the world in a more creative way right. and a more distinctive way and to think about doing things not the same way, but what if sure. we tried this? Yeah. And that I get super big yeah, energy I, I from. Mean, I could tell how much energy you're already yeah. getting. Yeah, like I like what I do. Yeah. So I, I answer the questions now looking back on when I haven't felt energized and what has been wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's when I get micromanaged, when people are not cannot live in shaping the future or possibility um you know we do this thing at diageo which is called defining our purpose right and go through a lot of work and i remember saying to my team i think my purpose is about using creativity to transfer business sure. and they were like uh that's really dull and that's not your purpose and yeah. i was like wow i spent a lot of time on this and they said no you're about you inspire the dreamer in everybody. And I was so it's a lot more digestible blown too. away. Yeah. I'm like, I consider myself the definitive storyteller. And they just looked at me and went, yeah, no, nah, that's not you. Yeah. This is you. And yeah. well, I there's, was, that, there's that quote too, where it's like a brand isn't what you say it is. It's what they say it is, right? Yeah. 
And that's what your people did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I'd say the other thing that's very important to me is, you know, being curious about culture, what's mm -hmm. happening, the new things that are happening. I mean, AI, tech, what's sure. it going to do for what we do? You know, it doesn't, you don't have to know or understand everything. Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand a little bit. I always say, oh, guys, I've got a little bit of information now. I just became really dangerous because yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be trying to work out how we should do it. But you got to be curious. Yeah. Absolutely. You gotta try shit. No, that's the only way you're gonna know if it works. I uh, you I wanna transition into the the whiskey business, right? Yeah. Like you walk in those doors, like Diageo <laughs> has everything under the sun, right? Like you're managing all these whiskeys. can you just label them out for our listeners too? Oh wow. Okay, so when I started no. It was yeah. North American whiskey. So it was Bullet, it was Crown Royal, it was George Dickel, it was Blade and Bow, it was Orphan Barrel, a so, couple of others, right? Then I went on to do uh, Irish, uh, we have Rowan Co. You got, you got then a, then a, I went on to do Scotch, Johnny Walker, yeah. Buchanan's, then Single Malts. Yeah. We've got kind of like Lagavulin, Oban, yeah. uh, Dalwini, uh, Talisker, uh, you know, I could go on and on. Yeah. Probably... So, so you walk in, I think for somebody who, that just feels overwhelming just hearing it, right? Like how much, like those are all separate brands. Those are all, they're under one like you know umbrella but they really are different companies in between totally. it like yeah. when you walk in those doors what are the pain po pain points that diageo had and like what is your you know what does your role look like yeah so when i came in uh i was really fortunate to be brought in by someone that had been my client for seven years when i was at jwt and we were working on smirnoff and i said to him I don't, like, I want to still continue to drive my own agenda in my own company. He said, that's cool. Why don't you just view it like the whiskey company at Diageo? And he gave me so much permission to think about the legacy I wanted to create for, for, for North American whiskeys because Diageo was, is, and is, still is, uh, uh, a very deep, deep scotch single malt company you know but north american whiskies wasn't anywhere else in the world and it was this small bubble in north america and we had sites and we needed to create distilleries we needed to create brand experiences uh we needed to grow the whiskies yeah. within north america and uh and he gave me permission to write the legacy of what i wanted to do with that we opened you know, we renovated Stitzelwella down in Kentucky. We broke ground on Bullet Distilling Company. Uh, that was the first carbon neutral company, uh, uh, distilling uh, site that we'd had in North America. We did another one like that. You know, Crown Royal went from, you know, kind of deluxe, the core of the brand, the yeah. purple bag, to an enormous trademark of amazing expressions of whiskies in the flavor area and in um, the aged whiskey area. So, you know, I had this canvas and there was nobody telling me where yeah. it could go or not. That, that's amazing. And with power comes responsibility, right? Like, and you have a lot of people working underneath you. What do you look for uh, in, you know, potential recruits, hires, et cetera? And like, how would you define your leadership style around it? Yeah. So. I look for energy. I look for uh, excite, excitement and curiosity. I look for a feeling that they're really into the brands, the work, the business, and they wanna jump in. I also, on the other side of it, look for skills. You know, what have they done before? What are they proud of? You know, how did they get there? And being able to articulate that because any great leader is gonna to have to lead other people and train other people and bring other people sure. through. And I look for people who have an ability to be vulnerable, transparent, uh, and who are into and interested and have empathy about the other people who are around them. Very, yeah. I think that's like you, you labeled all the things, right? Uh, with you know that move over to, to to with that move over to tequila, I got a little tongue twister. Uh, you know why? Obviously, you showed a lot of success 
on the whiskey side, yeah. but why tequila? So, you know, when you, seven years in whiskey, and I think they said it's about time she did something else. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't a deliberate choice for me. However, it was described to me as the biggest growth opportunity we had. Uh, we, I can see that. We had yeah. not had enough supply previously. And we'd only been really operating as a business in North America. And now we do have the opportunity to go and younger, younger global. drinkers yep. come along with that territory. Yeah. And we, um, and so they said we, it's an opportunity to develop a business and to create, I think one of the things that stuck in my mind was I'd worked on some of the most beloved brands in our industry, Johnny Walker, Bullet, these brands have been around for years and years and years and years. Right now, I have the opportunity to help us create some of the most beloved brands in the tequila and mascal business. So it's almost like an entrepreneurial yeah. opportunity. It's also a sort of, you know, the way I look at it is like I'm the CEO of our agave business globally. You know, how cool is that? Yeah. You know, you can awesome. go from building brands and making them stronger to creating brands and launching them to, you know, putting kind of brand homes out there, brand experiences out there. So, you know, it feels massive. And yeah. I always like to feel overwhelmed. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> you're, you're definitely a dynamo. What fires you up, like moving forward and just today? What fires me up? Uh, so from a business perspective, what I'm gonna create in the next three years and what I'm gonna learn and the cultural and- What are you gonna create in the next three years? The biggest agave business in the industry with some of the most powerful brands and a pathway to you know, new innovation and new formats and new experiences around them. I think uh, what also fires me up is just developing the the team, the capacity, the the cultural experience I'm going to have doing this. You know, I've been in Mexico twice. I'm an Australian. I learning any other language and me speaking other any other language sounds horrendous when I try. You know, I'm learning New York Spanish the same way. right now. Right. Yeah. I can't say it. everybody every time I try and pronounce something, people just burst out laughing. Yeah. You know, people are sending me, you know, but going down to Mexico. I was in, you know, uh, Guadalajara the other day. Like I'm learning yeah, that's about amazing. people, culture, life, business in yeah. different parts of the world. That's super that's exciting. Badass. You know, yeah. I also think about um, the being culturally led marketing model and what that means for different places in the world mm -hmm. how do you bring that together how do you understand it differently how do you continue to work with creators across the brands and um, turn experiences everywhere into great storytelling pieces that the rest of the world can understand um, I mean the impact of we talked about it before we got on here AI what's going to happen for yeah. content storytelling, media, creation. I mean, yeah, you know what I'm mostly everything. excited about is, you know, gone are the days of sitting in a room trying to think of all the possible ideas. Yeah. Like we now have tools where we can put stuff in and we can be fueled with so many ideas. And that's just picking the right one. Yeah, yeah. right? That's... It's awesome. Uh-huh. Like yeah. what a time saver. And it's only gonna and, get better, yeah. You know, it's get, and I think what you're gonna see is different kind of leaders come through, right? Because the art of strategy, the art of simplicity, clarity, decision making, I think is gonna be have to be even sharper. Yeah. With the possibilities that are gonna be created. Hundred thousand so. percent. I think that's a great way to to tie us up. Uh, I wanna go through our quick question round and then we'll get you out of here. For sure. Amazing. Shout out Open Fortune for uh, making this episode possible. We're gonna do a little quick question round, but first we gotta see if the fortune plays a little like, if it can reminisce with you on uh, what we just spoke about. Do you have uh, fortune cookies in Australia? So should yeah. I, yeah. Should I so, open my Yeah, open it, open cookie? it okay. and read it. I really like this. This yeah. is really cool. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> I love it. Mine says, love yourself oh. first and everything will fall into place. Airy. It's true. Oh, wow. That's Deep. good. Okay, ready, ready. Uh-oh. Mine says, oh, your presence is the most precious present. 
There you go. Wow. Yeah, that's a great one. That's pretty cool. Did you yeah. plant that? No, this is all random. <laughs> I want to do the the one of my favorite ones that we have is the the manscaped one. It's like the the tree stands taller when you trim the hedges. Manscaped, and then that's uh yeah that one's that one gets me tongue in cheek. Um, now I feel like I'm Indian. It's really yeah, loud. Yeah, yeah, no, it's all good. Here we go. Person uh-huh. you would most want to sit down to dinner with, dead or alive? Who? Um, David Boy. Great one. Favorite city in the world. You know what? I am going to say, oh, this is so hard because there's nothing better than going home and being on the beach. But I love Paris. I love Italy. I mean, I love Spain. I mean, just take me to Europe and I'm good. Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, Favorite rom-com? Oh, okay. See, I like really dark things mostly. But right. I will favorite, tell you. Favorite I, dark movie. No, <laughs> I do love coming to America, though. I always okay, like Eddie one. Murphy movies. But yeah, I like, um, I your like favorite, really like, scary shit. What's your I favorite like, movie? Well, I liked, you know, like uh, Northern Exposure, like quirky yeah, sort yeah. of dark. I liked, um, you know, what was that? Ozark. I love that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I recently saw something really dark that Alec Baldwin um, recommended, but I can't remember. Have you ever seen The Lobster? It. No. You'd like that. Super dark. Okay. If you like darks. All right. Yeah. I'm going to go there. Like the worst stuff. thing to ever watch on a first date with anybody. But like, <laughs> but like, yeah, it's uh, it's a crazy, crazy, like dark humor. Very dark. Um, let's see. Is it okay to sleep with socks on? I think if it's cold enough. Yeah. You're my first one of the day. I'm on your team. Oh, well, yeah. Well, is not in here, but... I mean, come I want on. to hear it. Don't you ever it. be watching TV and then you just go from TV to agree. the bed yeah, and you're like, like I'm not taking these off. It's yeah. Winter, it's like, uh-uh. all right, like, is it okay? Yes. We. You're my first yes today. And yep. thank yep. you. I stand with you. Uh, worst advice you've ever been given? Uh, not to challenge a offer and to be grateful for the position that you're in. Love that. And I did it for too many years. And my big advice to anybody would be to understand your value and to, you know, work out how to have mentors around you to help you challenge where you're at in life. Because, you know, I think, you know, I'm heading, I'm in my 50s, which I'm not happy about, but um, I think I would have done even more if I'd had people around me given me the confidence to challenge earlier in my career Mm -hmm. that's good in in one sentence how would you sum up the internet oh the internet i mean you know i used to call it the world wide web i used to call people who worked in digital when i was in strategy digi sizzle people right i think it's an amazing tool okay it is you know at its best when used at its best a huge fuel for imagination yeah huge fuel for knowledge and at its worst you know really damaging yeah you know and um i think we have a massive responsibility to think about how we use it how we entertain on it how we what we put on it um but also to try and encourage people to lean into how it facilitates play and inspiration, you know, Uh, and not forget that it does that. I mean, I would be less interesting as a person if we didn't have podcasts. It's one of my favorite ways to consume information. What's your favorite podcast? This one now. Um, There we go. Yeah, but... um, a lot of new stuff. Um, pivot. Um, Pivot's a good one. I, I like, like Scott it. And, and then and then I go down rabbit holes on yeah. people. Like if you mention something on yours that's interesting, I'll go down a rabbit hole and start yeah. that's start how it works. start listening. Um, I need to add more. So what's your favorite? Uh, give I me like, give me three that I should follow. Uh, I like uh, Armchair Expert is a good okay. one. Uh, I like uh, Today Explained. I had that, and it's, I it's good. fell I like off it, on I it. I like it better than the back. daily, personally. It's I, w- I used to be a massive daily fan, and now I've got a bit. Oh, oh, I maybe have got a bit bored. I'm talking personally now, but yeah. I've got a bit. Me too. I like. I don't know. It's a little dry for me, and it, it's funny. Ezra Klein, who started 
Vox, I think, or yeah, yeah, yeah. He, does, he does the daily podcast. It's all the same eco. Uh, and then I decoded would say, is good too. That's good. Yeah, one that's like. a good yeah. one. And then Smartless, I like. Yep, yep. Yeah, I've but, got Smartless. But I like listening. I mean, I don't think John Oliver has a podcast, but I like his stuff too. Yeah, and but. you know, not sort of. I did used to listen to Alex Baldwin's "Here's the Thing," and mm-hmm. I thought it was really good because it would always give you a rundown of what was playing mm-hmm. on Broadway. Yep. Amazing. And I always write them down and yep. then go and do it. So there, actually, st- I have one for you, and yeah. then I know we got to go. But uh, Freakonomics started a show called "Tell Me Something I Don't Know." Oh, that's and cool. And it's like they people go up. It's like a game show, and mm-hmm. they go like Malcolm Gladwell's there. There's like really smart people, and people go up and tell them things they don't know, and it's like the best fun fact back and forth. I'll send it to you after just an episode or two. I think you'd really like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are things super random, but it makes you very. They're very good for like cocktail parties to make you sound interesting. Things. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I was thinking, talking of sounding influ- uh, interesting, I was thinking about how the fuck did you get there and thinking about that my answer was a bit stock standard. And, you know, one of the things that I think has defined my ability to have courage, be a bit of a troublemaker and keep looking and be curious about doing things differently is the fact that I've traveled the world. You know, I've been thrown into different Mm. environments, you know, across Asia, Europe uh, and in the US. And I think that, you know, I've had this sort of notion of gathering experiences, meeting new people, finding great friends wherever I've landed. And I would say that, you know, the other piece of advice I ha- I'd have to people is travel, you know, get out there, get out of the kind of legacy uh, things that you believe you need to collect in order to get to the top professionally mm-hmm. and follow the experience of go. life train because it will That's serve serve up conditions and environments that you have to drive through at different points of your career than following something that's a little bit more expected. Uh, I love that advice. Last question I have in 2033, 10 years from now, where can we catch you? 2023. Uh, 2033. 33. Oh, wow. Uh, you know what? I need to do more thinking on this, don't I? Ideally, I think I'd like to be in Europe. Um, I would like to have water and a boat and good food. That sounds great. <laughs> That's my answer, too. Shelby, <laughs> thank you so much for coming yeah. on. That was awesome. Thank you. Oh, it was so great. good. Yeah. So good. Great to meet you. Yeah, you too. It was really fun. Yeah, I'm like, glad you had a good time.